All World Church of God presents the good word of God's Holy Bible and the joyful message of Christ's soon coming kingdom. Well, a warm welcome to each one of you. This is Phil Dunnigan with the joyful message of Jesus Christ and the good news of God's soon coming kingdom. As I speak at this date, in just a couple of days, Americans will be going off to the voting booths and they will be selecting the next president of the United States. I think obviously with the challenges that our country is facing at this time, uh, certainly this choice will have a lasting impact upon the future of our nation. I'm gonna state a truth of scripture which might come as a little surprise to you that American voters may very well not be the ones who ultimately decide who will be our next president. Uh, it could very well be God Almighty who decides who will be the next president of our country. You know, if we look in the Bible, we certainly see that God choosing a leader, that God looking down from heaven and, and looking at this, at this world and choosing a leader of a great nation is not without precedent. I want to take you back to the year 480 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar was king over what at that time was the greatest, most powerful uh, kingdom in the world, the great Babylonian Empire. This powerful kingdom had actually swept through the world and had taken uh, Judah into captivity about 606 B.C. We know that the prophet Daniel was taken with those captives into Babylon, and he served under King Nebuchadnezzar. But we know as we study the book of Daniel that certainly Nebuchadnezzar was puffed up with pride over his position and authority. And certainly he, he did have at his disposal this great, huge, magnificent kingdom that uh, was beyond any kingdom that had ever existed. You can read of, of this story in your Bible, in the book of Daniel, where that the God had given King Nebuchadnezzar a vision, and Daniel was called in to interpret this vision. And beginning in uh, Daniel, the fourth chapter of Daniel, beginning in the 24th verse, Daniel will say, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with a beast of the field, and they shall make you to eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times, or actually we know in prophetic uh, numerology that that is seven years, but seven years shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. And incredibly this happened. Who but God could have changed the metabolism of a man so that he would be able to assimilate grass like an oxen and be able to live out in the fields for seven years like a wild beast? Well, we know what happened. We pick it up in the 29th verse. At the end of 12 months, he, speaking of King Nebuchadnezzar, walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spoke. And he said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. And while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwellings shall be with a beast of the field, and they shall make you to eat grass as oxen, and seven times or seven years shall pass over you until you know that the, the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. And the same hour was a thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men, and he did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And then Nebuchadnezzar would say, At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding 
returned unto me. It had to be quite a shock when he realized how he had been living for seven years. And I bless the Most High, and I praise and honor him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to gen generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. Of course, we know that is his great angelic army, his angelic host. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What are you doing? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom and mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol, and honor the king of all heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to obey. So certainly King Nebuchadnezzar, with his lofty pride, had experienced that. Well, Daniel will earlier in this chapter reconfirm what Nebuchadnezzar had been humbled to learn. Uh, when he stated in verse 17, he would state this earlier, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets over, up over it the basis of men. And when you think of, of men such as King Herod, who... Uh, massacred, had massacred the uh, male babies under two years old in Bethlehem. When you think of men such as, uh, horrible leaders such as Nero, who uh, around 66, 67 AD uh, massacred Christians by the tens of thousands during the time of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. And you think of men such as Hitler, who, who massacred uh, by around six million Jews in, in his ovens and the, and the horrific uh, atrocities that men that obsessed with pride in their power and cruelty have, have wreaked upon uh, mankind throughout our history. So what does that mean for the United States? H has God chosen some of our presidents before? I think that most who truly understand the blessings of our country are convinced, and certainly it is an inspiring story, but certainly I think most of us are convinced that God has at times uh, caused wonderful men to be in a position of rulership over our country. I don't think there's any doubt of that. And as we think of men such as George Washington and uh, men such as Abraham Lincoln who realized the blessings of God that, that, that came from God, and they realized they understood uh, how much we needed to depend upon God, and they certainly were great men of prayer and men who read and studied the Bible. I want you to notice what Abraham Lincoln would write as president, and, and these, these are such uh, telling words. We find ourselves, he said, in the peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth as regards fertility of soil, extent of territory, and salubrity of climate. We find ourselves illegal inheritors of these fundamental blessings. We toiled not in the acquirement nor the establishment of them. And again in his proclamation of April 30th, 1863, for a nationwide day of fasting and prayer, this great president said, it is a duty of nations, as well as men, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God. Well, how many uh, would you be able to get to say that today? And to recognize a sublime truth announced by the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. We have been the recipients of the choicest blessing of heaven incredible statement and realization that Abraham Lincoln had. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our heart that all these blessings 
were produced by some superior, some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Certainly meaningful words as we approach our national day of Thanksgiving. But let's get back to the election. Will God choose our next president? And further, another question we might ask is, will he give us a president that we deserve? You know, when you consider the sins of our nation, the ever, the ever escalating, uh, heart-rending abortions that take place in our nation, the forcing out of God in the, of, of, of our schools and the Ten Commandments out of our courtrooms and compromises with homosexuality and an avalanche of other national sins. Asking the question, will God give us the president that we deserve, certainly is a chilling question. But for those of us who believe in God in our country, country Another sobering question certainly would be, will God have any impact at all upon the election? Will he turn his eyes away from us because of our national sins and we withdraw the blessings that he has once poured up out upon, upon, upon our nation? You know, what a, what a sad, what, a, what a, a, a disconcerting thought to think for one minute that God would remove the blessings that he has placed upon our nation. Now think of the lyrics of a song that Bobby Bear sang decades ago that went, God bless America again. You must know the trouble that she's in. Wash her pretty face, dry her eyes, and then God bless America again. Will God select our next president? Well, he certainly has the power. It tells us in Daniel 2 and verse 21, speaking of God, he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them and no understanding. And again, it tells us in Psalm 75, 6 through 7, for promotion comes uh, neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and he sets up another. The reality of it is, as we look out at the suffocating, overwhelming problems of our country, uh, there is no individual who has shoulders big enough to be able to take care of our problems. That is a job that only the coming Messiah, that Jesus Christ, can take care of. Notice in Isaiah, the great messianic prophet in the Old Testament, when he would say in Isaiah 2, beginning with the first verse, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains. We know that's going to be on Mount Zion and Jerusalem. And she'll be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come you, and let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord for Jerusalem. And he shall judge among nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, uh, neither shall they learn war anymore. But what a wonderful world that will be. We offer this booklet on our website, and uh, you, you can get it by, by accessing our website uh, at wrcog.net. That's wrcog.net. This particular booklet is uh, one of the pieces of literature that we offer, but it's called and titled The Kingdom of God. What does that mean to you? And it goes into uh, the details of, of how God and Christ will establish uh, their kingdom upon this earth. And you can also get it by uh, calling us at 505-286-0995. That's 505 286-0995, and uh, it's free of charge, and we, I 
definitely hope that you will write for this. And until next time, this is Phil Dunnigan, and uh, may God go with you.